All right, day 90. Uh, you can see here the uh, distance of what we accomplished last time. Came up and right back where we should be right where we left off. Uh, if I didn't mess up my editing somehow. Uh, so we're going to continue on building. What's building? Building, building, building. Uh, you see my little gates. I love gates. Tech thing. Got some glass cooking, and I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna warn you now, there will be lots and lots and lots of back and forth trips. Since all my storage and cooking facilities are about to be nighttime. Ugh. Working in the dark. I'm gonna try to keep things as well lit as I can, but I'm gonna continue working even if it gets dark, because there's just tons of building to do. Tons and tons. Anyways, back to what we were talking about before. Final Fantasy and all the things that are awful and wrong and great and special about it. Uh, today we'll move to my next Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VIII. After the experience with Seven, uh, I'll admit I became something of a Final Fantasy fanboy. Uh, and it was... Also, I uh, became a big Squaresoft fanboy, and I began collecting every Squaresoft game I could get my hand on. Um, specifically, I got, you know, it was when I, uh, I picked up uh, Xenogears. Well, I picked up, when did I pick up next? I think I picked up Brave Fencer Musashi, Musashi next. And it came with a demo disc that had, you know, the first small chapter of... Xenogears in it, and along with a teaser video. And if I can find that teaser video, I so want to put a post a link if somebody's uploaded it because that was like a really fun little. If you haven't played Xenogears, this is like a fun little. I don't know if I can just you know so you can get a look at what the gameplay looks like. And uh, that was, and then I picked up um, Threads of Fate, uh, Secret of Mana. Uh, Saga Frontier, Vagrant Story, Xenogear. You know, I just started grabbing every Squaresoft game I could after the uh, my experiences with Seven. And when I find that, found out that Final Fantasy VIII was coming out, of course I absolutely had to have it. And I went and bought it the day it came out. And I, I was ecstatic because uh, I forget now why. <laughs> Uh, like, um, I went and saw uh, Final, Fantasy, Final Fantasy Spirits Within when it came out in the theaters. And I saw it, uh, it came out right, right around the same time the first Tomb Raider movie came out. And I, got, I saw that too. And they were my, you know, my first real video game movies, uh, aside from that really awful experience with uh, <laughs> the Super Mario Brothers movie. Which, uh, if you haven't seen it, watch it just for the sake of a lot of laughs. It's really stupid. <laughs> and only barely um, pulls in on the uh, the elements of Mario. And uh, I don't know the, I don't want to ruin it because it's, it's stupid but if you haven't seen it you should watch it. Mario Brothers definitely. Um, where was it? Oh right, Fossey 8. So Fossey 8 comes out, and I pick it up, and, um, it's, it's, I'd read all about it, I'd, I'd had a subscription to, uh, the PlayStation Magazine, and they did this big, like, 10-page spread on it, and it talked about how Squaresoft spent, like, you know, $30 million just building a studio for the technology that was used to, like, render the cutscenes and shit, and, it was, it's ridiculous. They invested a mountain of money. Of course, they also used the same studio to do, to uh, film Spirits Within, or, you know, do the digital work on it. So, it's, you know, it was, of course, that was an unfortunately horrible flop. I don't really know why Spirits Within flopped so bad. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a great movie. It had Final Fantasy-esque elements to it. It worked for me. But, I don't know, I guess the general populace just couldn't follow it because they weren't used to the, uh, the weird Final Fantasy plotline 
mechanics that the, us gamers were used to. Although I think a lot of gamers didn't like it either, but uh, that's unfortunate. But I enjoyed it, and uh, it worked for me. So, anyway, of course, it had the uh, the preview um, of the opening cinematic for Final Fantasy VIII in it. And even still, to this day, watching the opening cinematic to Final Fantasy VIII gives me goosebumps. I don't know what it is, there's just something really epic about that intro. And I can't help but like be drawn to it in a really magnificent way. Um, I think I'll start out and uh, do the same thing I mentioned before and just get out of the way. Final C8 was not a great game. <laughs> It was fun. It wasn't fantastic. It wasn't a holy grail. It wasn't awesome. It was extremely convoluted. Like, the story made absolutely no sense. The characters were stupid retarded. And again, it falls back to the, well, I guess you can forgive them for being retarded because they're supposed to be missing memories kind of thing, which is built into the plot. The whole... Guardian Forces uh, presence is supposed to, you know, take up a space in your brain, air quotes, space in your brain, and uh, in exchange for this, it, like, basically eats up your, your memory. Um, so, like, all the characters are missing all their childhood memories or something. So, that sort of explains why they're all base and boring uh, individuals with no real personality, I guess. And uh, don't get me started on the whole Renoa uh, bullshit with the um, I just met you and now I love you. You're going to be my boyfriend for the rest of your life scenario crap. Because that shit is retarded. I mean, it's bad enough that, you know, anime uses it out the ass. But then here I am in a Final Fantasy. And the whole time this girl's like crazy into the main character. And, you're, and I can't help but wonder why. What did I ever do to garner this girl's affection? I mean, the main character is, is he's a douchebag, honestly. He's, he's distant and isolated and reclusive and he doesn't, he's not open or, you know, he doesn't share or depend on others or he's not honest with his own feelings and he's just this, this asinine child <laughs> that doesn't do anything but sort of just want to distance himself from others out of some weird, I don't want to depend on people because that makes me weak, etc, etc, some bullshit, I don't know, and uh, <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's a weak storyline, and as the characters are flat, they're very undefined, their motivations are purely, we were trained to do this, so we're going to do this thing. I don't know, I, I, the idea of taking, I guess it's maybe because I wasn't ever in the military either, that it really just bugs me, the whole, let's take teenagers and train them to, you know, be, take on danger, damn it, take on dangerous missions and save the world or fight for countries as mercenaries, etc., 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 whatever. And I just, it, the, the very notion of it just rubs me the wrong way. It seems like a really poor way to establish these characters as being militant. And at least in Seven, you know, the characters had to fight for survival because their world was harsh. But for the most part, Final Fantasy VIII seemed like a very peaceful, prosperous world. Like, even the more desolate areas, it just seemed like an okay world. Aside from the whole Gilbeta, Gilbesa, whatever the hell they were called, the other group, the enemy soldier guys, I guess it's because it was another nation, and the nation that you start in is all peaceful and prosperous, and da 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 But it just felt shallow and empty. But on the positive side, it had really killer friggin' effects, <laughs> and it was the first, you know, video game, really, to incorporate full motion video with, um, actual gameplay, 
and it was a cool thing. The only other game I know of that's done that at all was uh, Fear Effect, if you've ever played that. And it incorporated a lot of video. Of course, theirs was mostly boring animated loops. Not that 8 was much better. Don't, don't, don't think otherwise. 8 was still pretty boring. And had, like, especially the, uh, the battle scene when the two gardens are fighting and you end up finally on the ground with Renoa in your arms and you're running past this battle going in the background. And if you stop for a moment and look, it's just a cycled image that repeats itself. You know, it's, it's like watching an animated GIF. It's just a little longer than some. But it, it really is repetitive. And But it was it was interesting. It was the first time it had been done. And the first time is always, you know, gets a little leeway because it's like, woohoo, you did something cool and new. You know? And you deserve a little credit for that. And I'll admit that it's not phenomenal, but it is fun. Um, so, I don't know. I, I loved a lot of the idea in Fossey 8, and I especially loved the junctioning system. Like, it was kind of like materia on crack. The only problem was that because of the way the junctioning system worked, magic almost became useless in the whole game. Like, you would just, you know, absorb your hundred spells from a mob, junction it to your character, and then you would, like, never use that magic. I mean, the only time you, only magic you used was, like, curative magic. And everything else was just sort of ignored. And that's a shame, because, I mean, magic is a vital element in the whole RPG realm. It just, it's sort of what RPGs are. They're, they're, they're magic esque esque magic esque type games and then I mean you don't have to have magic to be an RPG but it's just sort of what it feels like it needs a lot of times and it just it sucked that because of the way the system was designed you were basically rewarded for not using part of the game and that just seems like a weird way to design an RPG it's like why do you a game in general I mean what kind of game developer wants to reward you for not, you know, playing a game. That seems kind of weird. Uh, the only thing I can say that was actually really interesting was, uh, in my opinion, the best part of what Fauci's, uh 8 introduced was Tetra Master. I think it was called Tetra Master. What, the card game was in it. Um, I know Fauci 9 had something similar, but I hated the one in 9. It seemed arbitrary and unusual and didn't really seem to follow any set rules most of the time. I just could never wrap my head around the game, I guess. But the one in 8 made sense. It had strategy, there was plot, and, or plot, eh, there was no plot to the card game. But the game had strategy and there was a certain way to play properly so that you could win all the time. And, and if you paid attention and knew the rules, you could succeed at it if you had the cards to back it up. And it's, it was just one of those games. And so it was great. I mean, it was a great little mini game device uh, that I really enjoyed entertaining myself with. Now, like I said, none of this is to say I didn't like Policy 8. I enjoyed it. And the little schoolgirl in me, you know, cried and happy at all the little romance moments between Squall and Renoa, despite the fact they should have had no business together. And it sort of makes me wonder how many people ever figured out that Squall was a, a Laguna's child. Um, I don't know if anyone, how many people actually caught that, but um, the, uh, the lady that runs the orphanage, who died giving birth to Squall, they don't mention that, but it's inferred. Uh, there's no absolute uh, certainty of it, but between of the reason I think that um, was it Noel, I think so, the, char the female character that allowed you to travel into the past and experience Laguna's life. The only reason I think that Squall and Laguna were so directly connected was because they were father and son. That and they kind of had a similar look to each other, um, except you know, like like. Laguna was like everything Squall didn't want to be. Like, he represented all the flaws of himself that he didn't want to embrace. 
the the carefree, the undisciplined, the you know stupid, childish side of himself that he seemed to be running away from all the time. And so it just sort of struck me as they had to be related, and it was a neat little element that wasn't listed directly in the game that I think was fun because it left you left it to your own imagination to figure out whether or not you believe that was a scenario or not. And I like those sort of things where you sort of like you gotta pick is this what they were trying to show or not in the storyline. And there should be more games to do that. Um, and then there was you know the first disc uh, even the first di two discs of eight were amazing and as far as the plot it was cohesive it made sense it flowed properly and then you find out that your real bad guy is some crazy ass evil witch bitch from the future <laughs> or something who's trying to use a time machine to destroy past or something stupid and it just it, it went like total bonkers and made no sense by the time you get to the end of it and you're like wait this is stupid <laughs> kind of a moment there and it's just it doesn't work and they they did it they they, they just sort of half-assed the, uh, the actual story I don't know they messed up something and it come, came out kind of weird and I, I didn't like the end game of it it just didn't seem right and then there was um, the final battle and especially the final battle uh, the, the prior optional boss battle the uh, Ultima Omega or, or maybe just called Omega or whatever it was this you know it's like the uh, the weapons for Fantasy 7 but it was just this, these ultimate boss mob option battle thing and the only way to beat him was to actually play uh, Tetra Master. Or, I think, someone let me know. Is it, is it actually called Tetra Master? Am I like just not remembering this properly? I don't. Um, <laughs> but I think that's what it was. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And uh, if you didn't play it, you couldn't, you know, convert the cards and into items, which you needed the. Uh, because like getting the squall card gave you the hero item, which lets you be like invulnerable for three turns or something. Yeah, the, uh, the only thing that really made it stand out to me was uh, the like Final Fantasy VIII had this this flaw you could exploit, and that was the uh, the the drive the overdrive or the limit system, whatever it was. I think it was called overdrive. Uh, maybe that was 10, um, whatever it was called, and if you intentionally left your one of your characters weakened, uh, namely this always came down to Squall, because he had the best move, but, or the best move set anyways, and um, you could intentionally leave him weak and exploit his ability to do, use his limit move. And it would just do it over and over and over, and you'd constantly use it. And uh, it made tough battles ridiculously easy to beat if you played them the right way and knew what you were doing. And it was just, you know, one of those, like, missteps in the mechanics of how the game worked that I think they should have reanalyzed before uh, releasing it. Uh, but it was, it was still... You know, I liked the seven system. Like nine had trance, and I think eight had overdrive or something. And um, seven had the limits. Seven had the best one. Um, I understood it better than any of the others, just because you know it was a meter that built up regardless of battle, and it made sense. So it, it just it worked. They should have stuck to something kind of similar because it, it functioned well, it did its job, and I like that, I mean, I like mechanics that work, and there's just not enough mechanics that work in everything these days, and it looks like I am out of time, so uh, I'll see you in the next video, goodbye!